Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to this Wiki Education Speaker Series. I'm going to put up a quick slide really quickly to talk about our work at Wiki Education. Uh, please hold one moment. Uh, so at w Wiki Education, we support instructors who have their students uh, contribute to Wikipedia as writing assignments uh, with a more impactful writing assignment involving your students having uh, contributing to Wikipedia in undergraduate and graduate uh, courses. If you're teaching and you have an interest in having your students research and write for Wikipedia, we're still accepting courses for the spring term and we have a lot of resources uh, and support available to you. It's free. Uh, feel free to check out teach.wikiedu.org. Uh, we also teach online uh, Zoom-based courses on how to contribute Wikipedia and, Wiki to, and to Wikidata. Go to learn.wikiedu.org to get uh, more details about those. There's a ton of courses available right now. And we also work with institutions who want to sponsor courses um, and sponsor one or more Wikipedia or Wikidata courses for their staff and their constituents to focus on a particular topic area. And we welcome you. If this sounds like the sort of thing that your uh, organization is interested in, visit partner.wikiedu.org. Now I'm going to unshare my screen and to get back to the uh, regularly scheduled program. And um, I would love for everyone to introduce themselves. Uh, let's start with LT. LT, would you mind introducing yourself? No, I don't mind. Thank you, Andres. Hi, everyone. I'm LaTanya or LT. I am a faculty member at Santa Clara University here in the San Francisco Bay Area. I teach part-time in the Department of Educational Leadership. And I specifically teach graduate students, so master's and EDD students. Um, my area of focus is on social social innovation and impact. And um, one of my like sub areas with that within that is the first generation college student experience. So excited. Awesome. Thank you, LT. Uh, Corey, would you mind introducing yourself? Hi, I'm um, Corey Stevenson um, in um, South Carolina, in um, Denmark, South Carolina, so about 50 miles south of um, Columbia, if you've ever been to the state, or either about 70 miles um, west of Charleston. Um, but um, we do um, electromechanical engineering with... Um, uh, both uh, dual enrollment students in high schools and college level. And um, one of the programs that we market is um, our Project Lead the Way. If you're not familiar with Project Lead the Way, I encourage you to look at it. Very well um, designed program that, um, that lays out um, engineering for those who are inspiring to be engineers. Um, and it also includes um, college level, um, two, this is a two year institution. So um, you can either go from here and go continue ed or either, you know, get your um, four year degree or either um, go out and be a technician or um, that level. So, but um, we are working with, um, uh, I would say we'd start with like 10th grade and on up. And so um, that has been a process, but um, great to be here. And look forward to continuing the conversation. Well we're, well, we're grateful to have you, Corey. Thank you. And uh, David, would you please introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. Um, I'm David Peña Guzman, and I am an associate professor at San Francisco State University in the Department of Humanities and Comparative and World Literature. Um, I teach primarily humanities courses, so that that's a kind of broad category that includes history, culture, the arts, but I was specifically hired to be um, our department's person that combines the humanities with the natural sciences and the social sciences. So by training, I'm a, I'm a philosopher and I specialize in the philosophy of science, 
um, and the history of science. Um, and that's the role that I played in this Wikipedia um, collaboration. Well, thank you so much, uh, David. And just so everyone is aware, uh, the chat is open for y'all to ask questions and communicate with each other during the session. Uh, feel free to add any questions for our panelists in the Q&A feature. Um, so without, the, I'm just gonna keep on going with it. Um, why don't we start with Corey? Hey, Corey, so what first convinced you to teach with Wikipedia? Well, one, um, we, we I tried to always incorporate writing as one aspects of it. So, um, and then the team building aspects. But um, when we look at Wikipedia, what, what really inspired me is that we would um, be doing people who are less noticed or who have done great work, but they um, want to be able to recognize them. But also that because uh, I work at an HBCU, um, Historical Black College, um, here in South Carolina, and um, much of the area that we work in are low to moderate income, um, African Americans as well as um, Hispanic, but a uh, uh, heavily populated um, poverty area. So just trying to inspire young people to um, see what they can do and see what has been done um, and how these people started small and yet has made a big impact. So that has been a um a big thing for us and um and they have been you know get to see people who start in one area and grow and develop and um help them to grow and develop and and they are inspiring engineers so they still trying to figure their lives out in many ways oh thank you Corey. it's exactly right i you know we're working this the whole point of this initiative is to inspire young engineers uh, to take up careers and to see themselves in the eyes of uh, of the things that they're reading on Wikipedia and uh, in new sources out there. Um, LT, can you answer this question also? What convinced you to teach with Wikipedia also? Well, the real answer is you, but uh, <laughs> I, can flesh, I can flesh it out a little bit. Yeah, would you mind? <laughs> Um, I started actually with the end in mind. I wasn't even thinking about teaching. I had mentioned at the beginning that um, my interests lie in the narratives of first generation college students. And I know that it had been challenging to just like Google who's who was first gen to college, for example. I had started to gather a lot of that information and then wondered, wow, where where can I share this? How, like, how can I amplify these stories and these narratives? So I was thinking about wow, it'd be great to put these on Wikipedia. But at the time, I, you know, a year ago, I had never, I had never touched Wikipedia, right? And so I had ended up connecting with you, Andres, and um, I really appreciated you saying, hey, learn how to edit yourself, but then think, think about scaling up and training others. Didn't even occur to me really, right? And so I had an opportunity to teach um, a, um, a grad seminar on social innovation and impact and ended up incorporating that assignment into my class. I know we're going to talk about it more, but that's how I came to it. I actually, it was already, already had in mind that I wanted to do something. I just never thought about teaching Wikipedia. Like, oh, you can do that, you know? So it was, um, obviously it was a great experience, but Cliffhanger, cliffhanger. <laughs> well, what a pleasant surprise. I, um, I also, you know, I just want to share a little bit of housekeeping things. Uh, this session will uh, go on until 1250 or 50, uh, 10 minutes before the hour, just so everyone is aware, we'll be ending right then. Um, with our next, uh, next question that I have, David, this one's for you. Um, you've par participated in our diversity and STEM initiative currently graciously funded by the Broadcom Foundation. Uh, it's so nice to have Paula Golden here representing the Broadcom Foundation. And the goal of adding, uh, it, the initiative goal was to add more biographies of underrepresented people in STEM to Wikipedia. Why does representation matter to you? Yeah, well, as, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, thanks for the question, Andres. Um, and we talk a lot about representation in the sciences, especially in 
connection to the representation of traditionally marginalized communities and the over-representation um, um, of certain sub-segments of the population along lines of class, race, and gender. And uh, those are really important discussions to have um, that have already been built into my courses way before uh, this collaboration with Wikipedia. And so for me, the spirit of this initiative already spoke to the learning objectives of the courses that I teach, where we talked about questions of class in the history of science. You know, why is it that people from a certain class, a privileged class position, are much more likely to become scientists? Why is there uh, this very uh, clearly marked Eurocentric um, bias to scientific knowledge? What are the barriers that prevent women um, from ascending to the upper echelons of uh, various scientific disciplines? And so those questions were, were already part of my curriculum. But I think the, the initiative that I partook in to increase um, the representation of traditionally um, underrepresented communities, especially in the Wikipedia archive itself, I think it also speaks to a different kind of representation that sometimes we talk a little bit less about, and that is how we culturally represent scientific knowledge itself. Um, because often we have this idea that scientific discoveries and scientific knowledge just sort of lands fully formed in our lap, um, especially for people who are not already fully trained scientists. Um, and, and I think the Wikipedia, um, that the writing of these Wikipedia biographies helped my students get a sense quite literally of how knowledge is made in the Wikipedia platform itself. But I also decided to connect that with certain readings about just the, the pragmatics of scientific research, right? The, um, the on the ground um, uh, requirements that come with doing scientific work as a way of changing our cultural representation of science. Because once people have a sense of you know, how the sausage is made um, and, and the pragmatics of science, I think they're much more likely to envision themselves as possibly doing it and that feeds into that second sense of representation, um, which is the representation of people in science. Well, that's it's perfect example. It's hard. It, it's amazing to sort of see uh, that how much you've thought about this in your own field and in uh, as a scientist yourself or a philosopher yourself, <laughs> and and and, do and doctor as well. So. Um, you know, LP, would you, could you have anything to add to this thought as well? Like, why does representation matter to you? Um, again, that's just, that's my own training. I, my, my field is actually literature, right? Even though I teach in the English department. And so being able to talk about um, confidently about representation, but sort of the nuances of it as well. I know for us, we opened up by um, reading Ian's great work about decolonizing Wikipedia. I think that for many of our, you know, I'm, I was teaching teachers, right? I'm teaching principals and, and instructors, but having them take a step back and realize that, you know, anything that we encounter is constructed, right? Um, and so how do we kind of deconstruct some of these things, kind of like what David was addressing peeling the layers back a little bit and going behind the scenes and, and realizing um, that nothing is truly objective, but how, um, but how when you sort of learn the hidden curriculum of Wikipedia is what we ended up um, referring, to, referring to it as, how it could be such a powerful tool and a tool for social justice. Um, and it is about amplifying these hidden narratives. That's the, that's the way I approached it. How about you, Corey? Why why is this so important to you? Why does representation matter? Well, I mean, looking at you know, like what everyone else said, um, when we when we look at Wikipedia, um, one, I mean, just the just the idea, you know, like when I came up, you know, I had to go and hunt a encyclopedia, and then hope that nobody didn't throw the page out, and that the edition was so old. <laughs> <laughs> but just the idea of having, you know, um, getting our young people to um, accept the uh, exception of that they can be a part of something that's greater than themselves was was um, fantastic. But um, 
and that this is an ongoing work and that you can add, you know, material to it as you go along. Other you you're not only doing it from your your small rural community, but you're working with uh, a larger and a broader um community was was even much more um fantastic to see and um a buy-in because so many times um people don't get to experience outside of their zip codes. And so this was a opportunity for them to um, be a part of something that was collectively larger than anything that, you know, that they could experience in their small communities. And um, uh, seeing that they can be connected was, was a buy-in, but, but the whole thing of just um, so many people who are making great contribution are unknown, they get a chance to study history and I think that that in itself also, you know, because um, we're dealing with a generation that um, they don't know history. So having them to be a part of understanding history, history and culture was a big buy in. But um, but, you know, the Internet is, you know, is more than just sh social media, looking at pictures, looking at what people are doing in your community, but to buy in and see that they can um, take part in um this elaborate um and 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 wikipedia has laid it out very nice um so that you can um get your get your um with the modules and the training but but just um them taking part of something that's larger than their zip code andre can i add something because i want to build upon what corey said absolutely I, please yeah well, i noticed with my students that once they get trained and once they start to see things there's some things they can't unsee anymore and so mm -hmm. then they'll start to say well why isn't this in, in wikipedia i did a search and i didn't see this and i want to add to it i just think it's just such a beautiful process to observe and i just can't understate the uh, the the level of empowerment that those students feel like once they get past that, and I went through it too, but once they went that, went, make it past that first initial sort of edit, right? And then you're like, oh, I can, I can continue to do it. It's just, it's, it's amazing. You know, uh, something that really, uh, that got me about what Corey said was uh, history and uh, how these students are literally engaging in a history making project which is so awesome and so inspiring to me and probably one of the, one of the reasons why i do my work at wiki education so um going back to corey i corey i i uh, this question for you um what was the reaction your students had to editing wikipedia's biographies of diverse people well, at first, you know, they um, <laughs> they all have this. Uh, that's ancient. Nobody don't do that anymore. Um, who reads anymore? You know that. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> yeah, this is really actually happening. This is what people do. This is how you. And I have to talk about it in this way: um, the king's language. Um, if you're going to be successful, you know how. Look at how they did what they did. You know how. What was their um, buy-in? What was their um, what did they have to do to climb that corporate ladder or whatever you know? And um, I think them understanding that process, but also understanding that um, that writing is a very important skill to have. You know, um, some of them have great writing skills if you, if you look at their work, but now take those same skills. Now you're using it for something greater than just you know, um, like and I'm pretty sure. Um, um, you being a, a English um, in that area, you can understand what I'm saying. That that's a buy-in for them using because they 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 learning to write. But why are you learning to write? Why why is that so important? And um, so some of it was, it was a it was a, a a learning curve that you just couldn't do it any kind of way. That you have all these orders and these um, steps and procedures. I think um, them learning to follow steps and procedures. And and it gives the uh, mm -hmm. article accreditation. It gives it um, validation, and it's not just something that you can just say, but you have to validate everything that you're saying about that person or what whatever credentials you're trying to give them, you know. And 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 for them to see order and steps and procedures was very important. 
uh, go for it, uh, uh, David. David has his hand raised. <laughs> um, uh, no, I, uh, sorry. Um, uh, following on this comment, I think that for a lot of my students, at least the feedback that I got was that it was not just really interesting, just in, intrinsically to follow the norms and the procedures for producing knowledge according to the to the rules of the platform. But many of them were motivated and inspired to learn that all of this is done typically by volunteers, uh, that there are people out there who are driven by a desire to make a contribution to a large and growing body of knowledge. And that that can be, you know, maybe we don't want to say a, a vocation, uh, but that that is a, a kind of calling that some people feel uh, that is worth their time and that is worth their energy. And I think some of my students developed a little bit of an identification to the volunteer um, um, baseline that makes up Wikipedia. And aside from that um, uh, element to it, there was also uh, something that happened in connection to writing with one of my students. I think in the education system, just by virtue of the, the, the teacher being the only audience that students are ever trained to write for, they sort of learn to write strategically. What do I need to do in order to pass this class to get the grade that I want? But built into the way in which we teach students is the assumption that nobody ever will see their writing and that there is no yeah. other goal to writing other than to check a particular box in relation to a syllabus. And the Wikipedia assignment kind of turns that on its head because suddenly they have to visualize an audience that is real and that is not the professor. And certainly that raises the temperature a little bit. It raises the bar of expectations, but it also means that a lot of students feel um, motivated to, to Race to to rise to the occasion, right, and to meet the bar. And so, some of my students, I I felt were motivated to write when they were when they knew they weren't writing for me. And as a professor, I I really appreciated that um, because it made them see themselves as writers rather than students. For I think in their in some of their cases, for the very first time. LT, do you want to add to that? You were not in a bunch, and I oh want to just. Uh, <laughs> I'm feeling all emotional. So, so here's the thing. I'm so um so David and Corey, so great to meet you. But I think it's important um for the folks here to see the impact on students at different points of the academic pipeline. Again, I was working with master's students and doctoral students, right? who had some of the same nervousness about writing as maybe the 10th graders um, over in Corey's area, right? Or David's students, same kind of concerns. I was also working with folks who were, many of whom were already educators. And so one of our early conversations had been, what has been your experience with Wikipedia? What have, what have you told students about Wikipedia and what have you been told? So we had to demystify, um, um, Wikipedia to begin with, but I, I I remember what it's like writing in graduate school in particular, where you do feel like you're just in this ivory tower and you're only, in this case, writing for your committee members, right? I had, and I, I just, you know, I really do get very emotional when I remember a student saying, this is the most important thing I've ever written, or, mm. or this is the one thing that my family can understand that I've written. Right. Um, so that they're like they're proud, their family very proud of them for being in graduate school and all that. But the page that they wrote on this chemist is the one thing that their family's like, oh, now we now we know why you're in school. Right. <laughs> so for me, that was that was a really interesting to um, see the students go on this journey. And so in some ways, it also doesn't matter what grade they are, they're going to probably have a similar kind of journey and it will have a similar kind of impact on them. That's awesome. Yeah, uh, I, you and I uh, just, you know, full disclosure, LT and I connect very often. And every time we connect, it's a beautiful conversation about 
what are we trying to do to i always feel like lt you always got something up your sleeve and we're always working to change I'm our not. like no no like obviously like, <laughs> like you know it, for the better here like for the better. <laughs> it, i i love i love communicating with you because we're both trying to do we're all trying to do something bigger than ourselves and it's apparent by from the work that you're doing with your students um i have this is quite this question is for corey hey corey how do you see this assignment complementing your other projects in your classes? Well, I mean, as I said, um, many of the um, students that we end up getting, um, it's a it's a far fetched thing. Um, some some get in in engineering because they heard that it's going to make money. Some get in it because they heard that. Um, they, they you may maybe because they have a high learning curve or whatever you know whatever they tell themselves but uh, other than i mean that what we want to inspire them to do is to see the process because i think um i think um them having a historical perspective of how change happens i think that's that just really just excel their mindset about Okay, um, so you 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 you're doing this article and you see this person how they have walked their lives through, and now they are in it and now they're making change. So I think um, the thing was um, um, you can you can do this, uh, and not only that you can do it. But these are the steps and procedures that you can expire. And I always talk about, I always talk about this thing of, um, you know, Bill Gates and Steve Jobs didn't didn't create the computer; they just made it better. And that if you're going to make it better, you got to understand the rules of the game. And mm. and there's no way to make the, the 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 better unless you you know you know the rules of the game. And so when you look at historical or what you know, all of these people that we are um, doing, they just made, they made it better. They made, um, you know, tools and objects better. And so, when, you know, with them getting into the engineering field and learning what is, and then see how what they learn what is, and but they took it, they took what they learned and made it better. I think that's, a, you know, a big buy-in so that they can see that engineering is a possibility. And, um, you know, it, you know, and using the objective like um, Steve Jobs and Bill Gates, um, just making it better. So you have to learn mm. the rules of the game, but then yeah. once you learn the rules of the game, how to incorporate that into you making it better. Well, we make Wikipedia better, we can make the world better. I, so, uh, hey, David, this is this question also for you. How, how do you see the assignment complementing your other projects? Um, my other personal projects or research projects oh, or you you mean the, the other your projects class. in the course yeah in the yeah course. in your okay. course yeah. yeah for a second i thought i misunderstood um, oh no 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 <laughs> um no i i think because the courses that i taught under this um um project were history of science courses there were very easy to identify synergies uh, between the content of the course and Wikipedia itself. Um, for instance, the course that I taught tells the history of science starting from the scientific revolution. So it begins from the 1600s and tells a story about the evolution of scientific knowledge, of scientific institutions through the 17th, 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries. And so in many ways, Wikipedia represents um, one iteration of the latest version of that history, the, the one of the forms that knowledge and knowledge production takes in the present. And so there is a way of, of suggesting that Wikipedia is already part of the content that I'm trying to capture in the mm -hmm. course. Um, and so being able to trace that story, for instance, we talked a lot about the different practical institutions through which knowledge is constructed. You know, we talked about the scientific societies of the 17, 1800s. We talked about the rise of university departments as new institutions for the creation of knowledge. And then we talked a little bit 
um, about the, the rise of the internet and the turn to digitality. And that's where Wikipedia enters the scene. Um, beyond that, I also, I, I wanna go back to this notion of how knowledge is made because getting the sense that there are people who devote themselves to producing knowledge um, was a theme that we returned to again and again in our course, because I taught a class that was largely um, Marxist in orientation. And by that, I just mean that I, I really encourage students to think about science as a kind of labor that individuals do. It's a kind of work that people perform sometimes in exchange for money and remuneration, but sometimes not. And mm -hmm. so when you think about it as a kind of work, then you start asking very practical questions that shed light on the institution of science and knowledge making. Questions like, you know, where is the money coming from for scientific research? How is it allocated? How is it spent? Where is it going? You start also asking questions about who does and doesn't get recognition for the labor that is being done. Um, so for instance, we talked quite a bit about what is known as the Matilda effect in scientific research, which refers to a bias that has been documented for over a hundred years in scientific research of women making important contributions to science, but then the, their male counterparts getting the recognition in the public eye. Um, we also talked a lot about something else called the Matthew effect, um, and which is a reference to the biblical passage about the rich getting richer and the poor getting, getting poorer, which also talks about the fact that once you are a really famous scientist that has, for example, a lot of grants under your belt, statistically speaking, you are much more likely to get more grants just because you have mm. had grants in the past, which creates a really bizarre cycle where it's very difficult for up and coming researchers to sort of break into those big scientific grants. And again, this is just a question of science understood as a practical activity that people do under conditions of work and employment with everything that that entails. And so, because that was already part of the spirit of the class, Thinking about the practical dimensions also of Wikipedia itself was really, really useful. And it got my students thinking and asking questions about how, well, now we should think about how knowledge is made in other fields, in other areas, in other platforms. Um, and, and this is something that came, um, came out in the class discussions quite frequently. Awesome, awesome. Um, you know, I this question is for LT, hey LT. How, actually, before we move on to that question, I'll just want to add on to what David, what you were saying. Uh, the the uh, this uh, I don't know what is the name. You said the tilde theory or the tilde phenomenon. I, I the Matilda the perfect, effect. Matilda effect. The Matilda effect. Well, we have a perfect example of that about Jennifer Doudna, where one of our participants uh, worked on her Wikipedia article, and beforehand it only mentioned uh, her contributions related to her male instructors rather than opposed uh, rather than her very uh, own contribution and she uh, is credited with helping uh, dis uh, discover the uh, uh, um, CRISPR and so it's a perfect example of that of that uh, effect um I uh, LT this question for you um how can Wikipedia be a platform for change well, I think a lot of that has been covered already. Definitely. Like, you know, Agreed. You know, what Corey and David have said, and I'm, I'm really appreciating the, the comments in the chat. I mean, it really depends, like part of it is content, right? That's a that's a big issue just in terms of um, who gets represented there and all of their accomplishments. Um, but then what's been rising too in this, some of this conversation is also just like the guidelines themselves which on the surface may appear to be sort of unbiased and objective, but we know that they anything that you create has some level of subjectivity around it. So we have to like create open forums and conversations and be transparent with students about it. It's like, like, yeah, it's great to have these guidelines and systems and orders, but then they also can lead to exclusions as well, right? Um, mm -hmm. But I think that's all part of the knowledge creation process 
I know that we've been talking about like, you know, scientists and, um, and other notable figures, but, and also there's just some like common everyday things that have come up. I'll just use a recent example of, and I've been going on my own Instagram page to document my wiki edit stories, right? Um, and one of the pages I wanted to edit was uh, Brittany Mahomes. She's the partner and, and spouse of NFL quarterback, Patrick Mahomes. And there's and it's just been a level of difficulty updating her page, right? She is a she is um it reminded me not not of the Matilda effect, David, but some but something just another form of gender bias that anything about her is only just tied to her husband and what he's accomplished. Although she's a she was a professional athlete in her own right, she's an owner of a sports team by you know by herself. But there's not a lot of good materials written about her to even update her page, and so. Um, all of this, you know, all of this is circles back to what you were, um, what we've been talking about here. Like, how do you make change? How do you even get the sources in the first place? What happens when your page gets overturned <laughs> or an attempt to be overturned? Um, but that that's part of what comes with writing in the public. That that is the that's the that is the side that like make that feel scary. Like you're writing for the public. Well, the public can read and respond, but that's okay too, right? We have to like just find ways to to um, be resilient. I, I believe someone had mentioned this before to be resilient in the face of of all of that. Well, you know, we're coming up on twelve minutes till we're done with this uh, speaker series. It's 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 been really amazing, uh, awesome to. See you all again and to hear uh, about your experience and to learn um, how you view Wikipedia as a platform for change. I want to open the platform or the the, the webinar to uh, to uh, attendees and to answer to ask any questions. And um, our, we have a, a question here from Tasha, and she's asking this, and, and we'll leave it open to all of us uh, if you want to jump in, and I can help uh, answer them as well. She says. She asks regarding rules of the rules of the game. I find that one of the most impactful elements for students is experiencing an object lesson in systemic injustice. When the rules of Wikipedia writing make it hard to write about people of color, women, LGBTQ, etc., I'm curious to hear your methods for helping to build resilience in tracking down sources, working within the restrictive sourcing guidelines, and arguing in support of pages. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, and help answer this question, and I would love for y'all to jump in as well. Um, Patra, great question. We are def at Wiki Education. We're definitely aware of the systemic injustices when it comes to the rules of Wikipedia and how also, broadly speaking, the systemic uh, racism in getting good sources about people in uh, about people of color, LGBTQ people and women. Um, and uh, you know, the great thing, I'm going to go ahead and cheer our wiki experts here. Man, our wiki experts, they, uh, we, uh, we rely on them a lot. And we really, uh, in this initiative, uh, students, uh, we were able to provide some names for students of potential of people who meet these notability guidelines. And some instructors were able to find some people of their own to add. And they went through a bibliography, bibliography check process to help those students determine that these individuals met Wikipedia's notability requirements. And so many thanks to our wiki expert team who was able to essentially go through and make sure that these people passed a Wikipedia's rules uh, for contributing to, uh, for having an article created about them on Wikipedia. Um, uh, does anyone else want to add anything to this question? I'm happy to jump in, um, Corey and David. Both, please feel free to chime in as well. I one one of the things I didn't say is that I only taught so far. I've only taught this one time, and I was learning how to write and edit along with my students, which by itself is an amazing pedagogical experience, right? Um, just like breaking down walls. What does it mean to be an instructor to go through a process with students? Having said that. Um, one of the things that I did was talk about my own process. So 
I created the wiki page, the one that's currently existing for Brianna Taylor. That was in 20, that was this year, right? Um, and talk about, you know, so she, uh, it wasn't related to STEM fields, but I was creating this page as my students were creating their pages. And we talked about why did it take so long for it, there to be a sustainable page for this really important person, right? Or um, um, what, what were the sort, you know, just sharing what I was going through created a really good conversation to talk about what the, like, as you say, what are the rules of engagement for um, for Wikipedia and like the real impact that this has. So you, why is there a page for George Floyd, for example, but there wasn't a page for Breonna Taylor? Like that alone was a just a fabulous kind of conversation. And again, this idea of being transparent about what's happening, that this isn't just something in a textbook and you close it and you move on. I think was like that real time, real life experience was completely invaluable. Thank you, LT. Uh, do you, uh, anyone else uh, want to add to any, any ideas on that, uh, going off of that and about the support and uh, that you're receiving on your end from our team or whether your students are receiving? I mean, the thing, the thing that I have to say, um, you know, I mean, one, what's so fas fascinated is that we're talking about the internet. So um, one, people getting used to it, but that um, these are ever changing opportunities that you can go on and you can change it and you can make edits to it. I think that's empowering in itself. So no one person can just do it. I think educating the community that um, what Wikipedia is so that they can be empowered to understand how the articles get, um, get published or get in existence. And that is a um, place where people can go in and, and always um, make changes, additions, I think that's empowering itself. So um, I think as people are are empowered and understand it versus a, a book that's published, it's sitting on the it's sitting on the counter. You know, it's it's is up there, it's published. But with, with Wikipedia, you have the opportunity to go in, add, edit, and and be able to give contribution. So that is an empowering process. So um it's not a finished process. It's a working process, I think, just, you know, with, um, and as, as as the generation get educated, um, we won't have a finished project. I mean, with Wikipedia, we will have a work in um, progress. So I think that's empowering. That's right. Yes. I, I you know, uh, Corey, I got this, I got this question for you. Um, unless anyone else, please, if you have any questions, please feel free to put it in the Q&A. Uh, we're coming down here on the last five minutes of this speaker se of this series. Um, I have five, excuse me of this webinar. Uh, Corey, what is the favorite part about teaching with Wikipedia through this project? What is your favorite part about teaching <laughs> with Wikipedia? Well, I I, I like um, you know I'm dealing you know with the young mind so um, and and getting them to buy into that. The, you know, what is this thing called the internet? You know, what, why was it created? I keep reminding folks that this hadn't always been around. So, <laughs> um, and getting them to um, see that it's more than just um, the small, it, it could be much more than that. And how we've gotten to this point. I think, um, you know, you talk about a generation who were born, you, you know, with, with the internet versus when I came along, so I'm fantastic. I'm I'm like ah, y'all got to use this thing. This all was created for you. Um, mm -hmm. This was with you in mind. You know, um, telling them the exciting news of how I used to have to walk to the library five miles only to find out that the library was closed and y'all can come back tomorrow. And then the next day it was raining. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> 
<laughs> so, I, you know, I tell stories like that, you know, uh, even if I had a library, you know, we, we <laughs> how we, um, in my community, we had a, um, um, a mobile, um, a mobile um, library would come around with the books and that kind of thing. And now, um, in, I mean, you know, um, you, you have access readily available to you. So, so I, I you know, I, I just try to tell exciting stories like that, you know, that, um, the internet hadn't always been around and 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 where does it come from so when i you know so i try to inspire them to see that you have this um um this thing in your hand um and that i no longer call it the cell phone i know i i call this a handheld computer and tell them about you know that <laughs> i was told you know um when i came up in the 80s i remember us having the first apple computer 23, uh, 23, 30 kids in the classroom and we all standing around one computer and hearing it make all the noises that it would make and and just a fantastic of how time. And I mean, I'm 52. So if that tells you anything, um, you know, and 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 just inspiring them to understand that, um, you know, what change can happen. And um, that's why I talk about that piece of um, Wikipedia is not, something that's sitting on the shelf with a finished project, but Wikipedia is an ever-changing process. So I think that's what's, um, what excites me the greatest. Well said. It's an ever-changing project. That's absolutely right. Uh, well, with our last two minutes, I wondered if LT, you could share what was your favorite part of teaching with Wikipedia was. Sorry. Um, for me, it was just seeing the lasting impact, right? How it's uh, all of this is evergreen. It doesn't just end with your, your in-class assignment. My graduate students still reach out to me and let me know when they've edited a page, a new page, or created a new page. Um, one of my students has added volunteering for Wikipedia on her LinkedIn profile, and we'll be talking about that when she goes for job interviews, right? So that's what I love. That's what I personally love seeing. Just mm -hmm. that it's beyond just your one class. That like you you can do this forever, and no one can take it away from you. How about you, David? You want to answer that question? Uh, yeah, I, I really liked. Um, uh, this is more of a pedagogical answer. Um, I really liked that it introduced students in a very concrete and applied way to the processual nature of writing um, and you know often we we create our assignments in such a way that deep down we know our students are writing the essays the night before and then they submit the first draft that they get yeah. um, and not a lot of focus on writing and rewriting and all the macro and micro negotiations that go on to get to a final product but because the assignments here are um, built with multiple steps already from the beginning I, I was really glad that it helped my students get a sense of what writing means because writing is always by definition rewriting. Um, the kind of writing that they read in an assignment is not something that just fell out of somebody's head fully formed. Um, and I think this gave them a real sense, a real taste of that. Well, um, we've reached the end of our webinar today. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, each of you, LT, Corey, and David, for agreeing to speak today. Um, and uh, thank you so much for your contributions and for your students' contributions and for having uh, Wiki Education and uh, Wikipedia be a part of your classrooms and your lives. Um, really, really much appreciated. And thank you again for being a part of today's webinar. Um, also, I'd like to just finish with uh, thanking uh, Broadcom Foundation for generously sponsoring the this initiative and for making this uh, work uh, possible uh, for so many uh, of students um, and uh, really, really much appreciated on our end to you. Uh, so without further ado, Thank you so much. Um, that is uh, the end of this webinar. Have a beautiful rest of your day. Thank you, Andres. Thank you, LT. Bye, everyone.